Hello friends, welcome back. I'm working on a standing desk in ash and last time I cut up a whole stack of components and they need planing, so let's get to it. Alright, that's the back legs done. I'm going to do the shorter front legs as well. And as you might recall from the previous video, when laying out these parts in the boards, I tried to get them so that the growth rings are running sort of at a diagonal, which creates this uh, straight grain on all four sides. I wasn't able to do that with all four legs. This one ended up at a much shallower angle than I would have wanted, which results in a very bland looking face on this side. And I have enough thickness here that I am actually able to sort of rotate the leg inside this blank. So if I, instead of planing this uh, face equally across its width, I instead bring down this corner to something like that. Then I square up the next face to what is now my reference and do something like that. And the same thing over here and the same thing over there. The leg has been sort of rotated inside the blank and the grain is still pretty far from diagonal but it's going to be a little bit better yeah i think that's going to be worth paying attention to <laughs> All right, the legs have all been squared up. I have one more piece to plane before we can start looking at joinery, and that is the back rail that will connect the two back legs together. So my rail is flattened, thicknessed, is cut to length and the ends have their tenons with haunches to keep the untenoned edges from, uh, from warping with moisture changes. These are rather tall tenons. If this rail was going into a style of the same thickness, like so, 
then I would have made this tenon less tall to preserve more material around it in the mortised piece. But because this is going to be mortised into a leg that has a lot of thickness, I decided to prioritize glue surface over structure around the tenon. I think that's the right call. Uh, maybe it's not, but um, that's what I'm doing. So these are the back legs that will be connected by the stretcher. They will be oriented with their reference face facing forwards and the reference edges facing towards each other. And the rail is going to sit just above the shelf, right there. And then I position the rail so that it's at that pencil line. And I'm going for, you know, you can come right up to the pencil line or you can cover the pencil line. That's a difference of like half a millimeter. And I'm going for the lower of those two options so that I won't get a gap between this rail and the shelf. If anything, I can plane the bottom of the rail a little bit to get a gap-free fit between the shelf and the rail. With that in place, I can mark how long the mortise is going to be. And that's where I need to chop. I'm gonna transfer this pencil line over to the other leg, but not the lines for the mortise, because I don't know that these tunnels have the exact same dimensions. They most likely don't. I transfer instead the line that corresponds to the bottom edge. Then again, align it so that the bottom edge covers the entirety of that pencil line and nothing more. And scribe around the tunnel. So that's the back rail connected to both legs. I've checked it for square, it looks alright and uh, the shoulder lines are decent. So next up I have the lower sides that will attach like so and uh, hold the shelf across them like that. So these need planing and then I'm going to attach them to the lower legs. So here are my lower sides and these are going to be joined to the front legs. Again I have my reference uh, marks pointing towards each other and these legs are going to join these rails like so with an angled bridle joint. Now I don't know what that angle is and it doesn't really matter but I do know the ratio, the relationship between the height and the width of the angle. So I'm just going to draw that on my bench. So if I connect these two lines and those measurements I just took off my one-tenth scale drawing. So now that those are connected I can just set a bevel gauge to that angle and there's the angle of my leg uh, without needing to know how many degrees it is.
And here are the finished assemblies of the front legs and the lower rails. I decided to go for a bridle joint here because when you have a leg that is splayed out at an angle, I'm going to show this upside down just to fit it in the shot, but if you imagine force being applied here, that is not transferred directly down the leg. Gravity is perpendicular to the ground, so what happens is it applies a torque to this joint trying to, uh, to bend the leg out of the rail or vice versa depending on what joint you do. And the advantage of a bridle joint in this application is that it gives you four shoulders to resist that torque rather than just two shoulders uh, of a mortise and tenon which in a lot of other applications is the better choice for other reasons. But here I really want that mechanical locking of the parts in this particular orientation and I do think the bridle joint is the best in this case. Of course it's still important to have good glue surfaces so that you also have a strong glued joint. So I'm happy with that. And I think I'm going to call it there for this episode. The front legs are joined to the lower rails and the back legs are joined to the back rail as well. All woodworking projects start as, you know, a subtractive process. You're just carving away material and trying to find the parts inside of the board by removing. But then you reach the point where you start cutting joinery and putting pieces together and the subtractive process instead becomes an additive process. You actually start seeing the piece of furniture that you have in your mind take shape in reality. And I think that's really exciting. So more of that next time. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.